Welcome to Wild and Exposed. Your number one adventure, nature, and outdoor photography podcast. Wild and Exposed is hosted by Mike Morrow, Ron Hayes, and Jason Lopez. Thanks for tuning in. So welcome back to Wild and Exposed podcast. And uh, this evening we've got Michael Morrow coming to us from where, Mike? I'm in Durango, Colorado. I've been down here photographing these hummingbirds and I just can't bring myself to leave. So, And since I don't have any work going on, I figured I'd just stay here. <laughs> Might as well. That hummingbird stuff, I, you'll have to put some links in the show notes because it's amazing to see from where they started. Um and then you talked about how the nest expands because they build it with basically spider silk and uh, and lichen. And then sure enough, you the second set of footage that you sent, Jason and I, you can see that expanded nest now that they're hatched and, and getting bigger. And it's an amazing thing. It is. It's amazing to watch what she does. And then my buddy, um, it's at his house. I just I told you guys the story last time how I found it. Well, I'm back, I'm staying at his house again, and he's having some work done in his garage, and it just so happens today he had a scissor lift delivered. So I'm hoping maybe tomorrow I can get in that scissor lift to get above it, above the nest. Because oh, yeah. right now I'm not quite eye level, but, you know, I'm, I'm a little bit below. So you still see the heads poking up, but you really can't see in, inside the nest. And I don't have a tripod tall enough if I got on a ladder, and that camera's so damn heavy that I wouldn't be able to hand hold it up there so i don't know it might be worth a try tomorrow if i can the contractor didn't leave a key well i haven't checked yet it's gonna have to be on the sly so I'm gonna have to go. oh i thought he rented one for you this is the contractors that you're gonna no this is the contractor scissor lift so i'm gonna have to go commandeer it or hotwire it it's gonna be reappropriated to... yeah <laughs> and then we've got we got Jason Loftus. Jason, you're looks like coming to us from home. Yep, yep, here in Utah. Utah. Yep. How and I down have there. not been trying I have not been trying to commandeer any scissor lifts. I've just been <laughs> out chasing some owls around actually with some of the local folks here. So it's been kind of fun. That's I'm excited to see images. I've never even I thought I knew all the well, owl species from North America, but I've I'm never, yeah, I'm actually excited to see some images too, but I because I haven't taken any yet. But <laughs> and what? but it was fun to get out. Um, so the species that we were chasing around was flammulated owls um, and sawwets, and at, after dark. So this was a new idea for me. I couldn't understand how we were going to photograph birds in the dark. I didn't know if somebody had a new camera that I wasn't aware of or <laughs> something, but. <laughs> I mean, I've been hearing about this new cannon coming out that can shoot at, you know, 120,000 ISO or something. But, um, but anyways, no, it was pretty fun and you, you, with a bright light and some calling. And um, we had quite a few owls respond to us, but did not get, have any luck with any that came into actual sight. So, so are you guys pretty, like doing surveys or anything like that? Uh, no, just going out just and photographing. staying up till one in the morning trying to find owls and then going to work. <laughs> so how does how big are these you said flammulated, right? Sawwets are pretty small. Yeah, so are the flammulated. Yeah, the flammulated, I've been told, they are about the size of a can of Coke um, all the way around. So they're not as fluffy as like a, um, some of the other owls, and uh, they're, but they're really super small still. So they got great big black eyes, and they're pretty neat. They're, I've seen some photos on Instagram. If you go out and just you know do a hashtag flammulated i'm sure you'll pull up uh, quite a few images but pretty cool little birds and apparently they can be pretty tolerant to the light and doing some photography so still some high iso stuff right um so i was kind of interested to go and give it a shot and see what i could come up with but so are you shooting with your sony for that or your nikon um i actually was shooting with my nikon but like i said i didn't take a single image um but with the topaz software that we've talked about before and some of the other images I've seen from some of the other folks that have been doing it. Um, one one of my friends took an image at 10,000 ISO with his Sony A7R3 and the two to 600, and it's in, it's in, it's impeccable. It's a crazy good image. 
So I was pretty impressed with, uh, you know, the ability of, you know, and some of that, he did some cleanup on the background stuff with um, Photoshop, but the owl itself looks super sharp and looks really good. So, huh? So did you find sawets too, or just the flammulated? Just the flammulated is all we had respond back to us. We actually had some come in pretty close, but we just couldn't put eyes on them. Um, and sometimes it's just the way it goes, right, with anything. So I'm, I'm excited to go out. I guess they do this. This is kind of their mating season, and they do this in through the end of June-ish time frame. Um, but I'm kind of looking forward to maybe taking another night over this weekend maybe or something and going out and looking again and seeing if we can't get one to cooperate with us and get some photos. So You should do it for Father's Day. That's your Father's Day gift yeah, to yourself. You <laughs> yeah, yeah. Come on, honey. <laughs> <laughs> You're coming with me. You're gonna run the light. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. <laughs> and we also are joined tonight by Dale Evans. Dale's been on the podcast before. Um, I believe season one, correct? And yeah, Dale's... it was uh, about this time last year. Oh, season so it's season two. Okay. And then, uh, Dale, you're coming to us from Montana, correct? Yeah. Uh, nice, cool, rainy Bozeman, Montana. I just, fortunately, the Montana governor changed some policies, which allowed me to get up and film a badger den in the Montana portion, or at least I had to go through Montana to get to where it was. But it, it uh, turned out to be a pretty good shoot. How are things going for you shoot-wise? Have you been um, getting out? Pretty good. I've I, I haven't gotten out and done a lot of photography lately. I've just been kind of busy with uh, springtime activities for work. Um, but at the same time, like you know, I'm still making images here and there, and you know, it kind of. I think for my work, you know, I, I make just as many images there as I am making, you know, kind of for my side gig, if you will, now with right. just, just the photography. I follow both you and is it Michael Parente? Is that his, how you say his last name? Yeah, yeah. It's there's an awful lot of shenanigans going on, so I don't know how much work you guys actually get done. <laughs> <laughs> there is never any shenanigans. At all. <laughs> I can promise you that. He's got some. He's got some good dance moves, actually. <laughs> right. <laughs> right. It's pretty funny. Hey, so Dale, you should give us a little background on your photography just so people have an idea of what, you know, if they haven't listened to the previous episode with all the new listeners, just give us a, a snapshot into how you got into photography and how you got to be where you're at. Yeah, so uh, I picked up photography, I guess, about five and a half, six years ago now. And I literally just moved out west after the military and bought a camera kind of on a whim as I just want to document wh what I'm doing when I move out West. Cause like, my whole entire family's from back East. I'm, a, I'm born and raised in Florida and I just really enjoyed it. And then I moved up to Bozeman to go to college. And that's where, to me, that's where it kind of took, took hold, I guess you could say. Um, and as I was going back to school, photography got more and more into it. And I actually changed my major, and that's where um, I decided to pursue photography full time in college. And got my degree, graduated last May, and not even a month later, I had an opportunity to uh, take a position filming um, outdoor related content for Randy Newberg and uh, the Fresh Tracks team. So. That's kind of what I've been doing over the past year, and it's been awesome. It sounds like the fast track to professional photography, cinematography. <laughs> yeah, um, it, it's funny, right? Because, I mean, I'm, I'm filming hunts even though I didn't have a lot of filming experience. Like, granted, we did some of it in school. Like, you kind of go through editing and, you know, just understanding the video side of life. But... I would not have called myself a videographer at the time, and I really still don't. I just kind of consider myself a producer, if you will, a content producer. Um, yeah. So I can say kind of both sides of that. But it was definitely a fast track because, like I said, I mean, I literally had just picked up a camera for the first time just over six years ago, I guess, now, looking back at it. I, I think a lot of that had to do with being 
a little bit older and kind of going through college and knowing where I wanted to be at in the long run. So I tried to position myself as I was moving along through college with like working with RMEF and Wild Sheep Foundation and, and, and making those connections there on the wildlife side, as well as in the outdoor space of like working with different companies like First Light and Weatherby and, you know, just different co- companies like that. So I, I, like I said, I just, I knew where I wanted to be and I wasn't getting younger. So it was like now or never, you know? Awesome. You've also, I think your, your family's grown a bit since the last time you were on the show, right? Uh, I guess technically, um, I mean, I was engaged at the time, but now, <laughs> I'm, you know, now, now I'm officially married, right? So yeah. Awesome. Uh, I got Congratulations again. November. Thank you. Jason was there for, uh, yeah. he got to stand up there beside me. So that yep. was good. Honored to be there. So you guys have known each other for a while. How did you actually make that connection? Yeah. Um, I think Jason and I had met. So I, I moved to Bozeman in August of 2015. Am I remembering that correctly? August 2015. And I think we met in September and it was one of those type of things that, you know, and I, I get a lot. I mean, I, I understand Jason was stalking me on Instagram per <laughs> usual, <laughs> you know, he's like, Hey, I'm going to be up in your neck of the woods. And I'm like, who is this guy? But, you know, uh, <laughs> Jason, do you want to- Jason, you better fill in some blanks it? here. Yeah, I better There's tell the truth. Yeah, no, actually, it was the other way around. He was stalking me, and <laughs> no, actually, I think, I think, I think, and he can correct me if I'm wrong, but we, I was headed up to that Bozeman area to do some photography, and I don't know if I mentioned it in my story or something like that, and Dale had caught wind of that and just kind of reached out to me. What? Say that again. I was saying, I was saying, Instagram didn't have stories back then. Oh, sorry. So I don't know how. What did I did I post it? <laughs> so, so I don't so remember. This, truthfully, what I think it was was uh, you and I had been talking even when I was still living down in Wyoming, and oh. I had told you that I was moving to Bozeman or to Montana, and we could do you know at that point we had kind of kept in contact, um, and I was at you know I was kind of very new into photography at that time right I mean this was over five or I guess five years ago now. Um, so I was like really, really fresh into it. And I looked up to Jason, you know, like seeing the images that he was creating and everything. So, you know, we just kind of went back and forth as newer photographers, I guess you could say. So anyway. Now you're right. And we were in contact quite a bit and kind of helped and try to support each other a little bit. And and then it worked out where I was headed that direction. And he had some time that we could actually meet in person. And if I remember right, we met, I can't remember exactly where we met, but we got, we got in the same vehicle and we started cruising around and just started going out and chatting and taking photos. And honestly, it was crazy. The friendship just, it was like immediate. I mean, it was just like, we, we had a lot of the same beliefs, a lot of same philosophies, and we saw things a lot the same way and we just hit it off really quick. And, um, I don't think we, we've been pretty much in touch on a regular basis ever since that day. Um, and then, you know, during that time, we actually had probably one of those pretty crazy, cool experiences with some elk that probably helped cement that friendship too, to be honest with you. Cause I've never had an experience like that before it. And I've never had an experience like that since. Um, and I don't know, maybe I'll, I'll let Dale maybe tell a little bit of that story, but it was, it's one of those for the books. And, uh, actually Dale actually has some images too from that encounter. So as he tells the story, I'm sure we can post them out there on the, the show notes and uh, you can see the reality of, <laughs> of the circumstances and see what a cool encounter this actually really was, but go ahead, Dale. <laughs> yeah. Um, it, it, it was awesome. So like Jason was saying, we'd met up the, the night before we, you know, instantly hit it off. I mean, you know, it was like we'd known each other for years and um, so decided to get back together and, um, met up the next morning before daylight and went out and and it was kind of weird it was like we wouldn't we weren't hardly finding any elk and i think it was september 20th give or take um you know kind of that peak rut time period and 
could not find an elk to play or, you know, to, to get into position at all. So we just kept rolling along and, and finally we, we stopped and we'd heard some bulls bugling, but couldn't see them. They, they were, you know, back off away, you know, in September. And I told Jason, I was like, let's just go. You know what I mean? Like, you don't know if you don't go type of thing. And he's like, okay, you know, let, let me get my stuff type of thing. And Jason's a little bit shorter than I am. Um, I've, I've got some longer legs. so My legs are definitely shorter. <laughs> <laughs> um, so, so I take off and get to the timber and kind of start, like, we're, we're making a game plan to try to figure out where these elk are because we can hear them bugling and they're bugling back and forth at each other and everything else. And, and I was like, okay, we, we, we got to go. Like, they seem like they're moving away or like pushing their cows that way. So I literally just took off and I, I go, I don't know, roughly 800 to a thousand yards, I'm guessing. And I look back and like, Jason is nowhere to be found. Like <laughs> literally. Um, uh, so I, he was not I joking disgusted. when he said we got to go. He was gone. <laughs> yeah. So, so I'm like, Oh, well, he'll catch up. He will hear these elk bugling and he'll know where I'm at type of thing. So I kind of keep going and I walk for another, you know, 15 minutes or so. And, or I guess probably 10 to 15 minutes. And I look back again and like Jason's nowhere to be found, but now I'm getting kind of close to where this, these elk are. So for whatever reason, I throw out a whistle to try to let Jason know where I'm at in relationship to where the elk are. Cause I'm thinking he can't be more than like a hundred yards behind me. Right. So I throw out a whistle and like nothing happens thinking he's going to whistle back at me and nothing happens. And I'm like, Oh, screw it. Like I, I, I got to get on these bulls. And so I, you know, walk another couple you know, a couple minutes or so, I look back again, Jason's not there. I whistle again. And when I do, one of the bulls bugles. And I was like, ah, that's just coincidence, right? And I'm kind of standing there and I'm like, I don't want to leave him. Like, this dude's my ride. I've literally met him <laughs> yesterday. And we you know what I mean? And like, night, even though yeah. I just left him in the dust. Right. Well, I mean, you know. I mean, he said that we had similar ideology. I think he would have done it to me if he could have, <laughs> you know. Fair but, enough. <laughs> um, <laughs> so we literally just take off, or, or I'm 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 in the moment and everything, and I whistled the bull bugles. I'm thinking it's just a coincidence, but I'm standing there, and I whistle again, and when I whistle again, the bull bugles again. And all I'm doing is just literally just whistling with my mouth, like not using my fingers or anything to like make it louder, just doing a little whistle with my mouth and the bull bugles again. And at that time, I'm like, OK, first time coincidence, second time starts to become a pattern. Right. So I start moving up and I'm kind of getting into this thicker, you know, dark timber at this point where these elk have moved into. Cause I mean, it's getting, I don't know, 10 o'clock in the morning, give or take. And I whistle again and this bull bugles. And this time, like he's got that. I'm pissed off. Like, like who's this dude coming up behind me type of bugle, you know, just guttural and everything like that. And I'm still like looking back at Jason, like what's going on right now? Like, you know, like, where's this dude at? Like, he's got to be close. Right. I mean, I'm kind of stopping. So I just start slipping through the timber a little bit more and I bugle or sorry, I whistle again and the bull bugles and he's cut the distance in half from me to him. And he, and he just gives out one of those like deep, just growling, nasty guttural, you know, bugles that like, send chills down your spine type of thing just one of the awesome awesome things and so i i kind of walk up a little bit further and i kind of get into this what i think is a shooting lane you know like photo photography wise like a little opening and i whistle and all of a sudden i can hear branches breaking and this bull is busting the timber down coming at me like literally coming in on me so i just hunker down 
And this bull comes walking in and the first photo that I snapped of him, he was about seven yards away. <laughs> and then he bugles and, and, he, and like, I mean, he was just, he's foaming from the foaming uh, at the mouth mad you know and he and he takes a couple more steps and he stops and at that point i was shooting with my 70 to 300 on my canon and i had the the lens zoomed all the way out and all i could see was the base of his antlers his eye and maybe half an inch below his eye (laughs) and i i go to take the second photo and when i took the second photo the bull looked down and you would have thought that he had gotten a fire lit up under his you know what and got out of there breaking every tree in his way and takes off and about that time i kind of look across from where it's at and like here's jason like huffing and puffing standing i don't know 40 50 yards away Give or take? I was about 20. I was pretty close. Okay. I had snuck in by that time and I had saw it all go down. But yeah, I was because I, I was able to at least see it all go down and it was pretty crazy. I was about 20 yards away. But Okay. So do you want to tell it from your angle of like what happened at that point? Yeah, sure. I'm like, what the hell? This dude just left me in the dust, man. <laughs> and I'm not giving him a ride home now, that's for sure. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Go ahead, Jason. So yeah, so so yeah, from my perspective, I just see this all coming down and I can see Dale and I can see I saw probably I saw him make close the distance and I heard that bull bugle. I heard that guttural bugle. And I mean, just I know that's just boy, he's he's ticked. He's coming. And like he said, you could hear trees breaking in that. And I was like, holy cow. And I'm trying to get my tripod set up and get ready. And it's really thick in there. There really wasn't a lot of opportunity for 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 photos anyways to be quite honest and then i see (laughs) i see this bull get close to dale and i see him about seven yards away like he said and i see him take that first photo and then all of a sudden you know he bugles again and he comes forward and i'm over there going like holy cow this bull's gonna run him over man and i'm like literally getting ready to like try to like make some noise or wave my arms or something to get this bull's attention so he doesn't run dale over and he stops right above him and he throws that other bugle out and like Dale said, I was close enough. I could still see the drool and that coming off this bull's mouth. I mean, he was fired up. And <laughs> as soon as Dale, I heard that shutter go click. And as soon as I heard that click, that bull whirled and like just come unglued. He was running and every tree in his way was just plowed down. I mean, we Dale and I literally went and walked that walk that path that he left and literally was knocking over small quakies, just busting them off like they were nothing. So we actually followed him for a while, and we never were able yeah. to get back on him again. I think, yeah, uh, <laughs> I think we gave him a good scare for whatever reason. But, <laughs> but yeah, well, from that point, we just followed him for a while. But you know, shortly thereafter, right? Like he's like, we're we're kind of talking about it, right? Because we're we're both in di- in disbelief of like what just happened, and this is so cool. And you know, again, it was that Pikra area or you know time frame that they're just so fired up, and they just want to you know, try to knock over anything that gets in their way. And I'm just like, did that really just happen? Like, did I just whistle, bugle, whatever you want to call this bull in to me? And that second image, I I, I don't think Jason kind of talked about it, but I think that we stepped it off and I, it was give or take six to eight feet at the second point. I mean, it was just, it was crazy close. Yeah. Um, so we're, we're walking out and like you said, we're kind of following these elk and we kind of given up on them. And I was just, he's like, well, what sound were you making? You know? Cause I think he was so far back that he didn't really hear me or anything like that. And I was like, I just whistled like I normally would. And I, and I did it in a bull bugled again. <laughs> <laughs> right. And we're standing side by side. And I was like, I was like, that's weird. Right. And he's like, that's crazy, man. I've never seen anything like it. And I was like, I know. So I, I was like, you wouldn't think that this does it. And I whistle again and the bull hit bugles and he starts coming in and we're standing in a big open meadow. And here comes this <laughs> five point raghorn walking in to like 30 yards 
and makes a circle around us. And he's like, you know, he's like looking around, like trying to figure out what's going on. And we're kind of standing up against the trees and taking images. And this bull just like makes a circle around us. Like, you know, I, I just heard something right here. Like what's going on. But it was just, it, that kind of cemented, holy crap, this, you know, this is actually working. <laughs> yeah. So yeah, that was the first time that we met. Yeah. It should have <laughs> cemented, holy crap, this Jason Loftus guy is, he may be the good luck charm that I needed to kick my wildlife photography career off. It was the other way around, because he's like, I've never had an experience <laughs> like this with any other person. I was like, I do this every day. What are you talking about? <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. <laughs> Isn't it? You know, and I think that's that's a good point because when we when we do have an opportunity, you know, we all have contacts on Instagram and Facebook and and that kind of thing. But when we have the opportunity to actually get out in the woods with these with people that you know, other than knowing them online, are complete strangers, it's amazing how quickly friendships develop. You know, and I think a, a a few in the last year, year and a half. And we've had, because of the podcast, we've had an opportunity to to meet people that probably otherwise we never would have met. And it's just been incredible to be able to spend time in the field with everybody and and uh, get to see some of these things that that we live for. I can imagine that encounter is something you guys will never stop talking about. You'll never stop telling that story, you know, and about how you guys met. And those are the things that just kind of create those lifelong relationships. And I think, uh, I think there's something to be said for that. The other thing that that speaks to is when you have an encounter like that, especially with elk, I mean, you can have it with moose and maybe a little bit with deer, but for some reason, elk, an encounter like that is just, it's magical, right? I mean, that's the kind of stuff that makes the hair on the back of your neck stand up or, you know, when they're just raging, mad, or interested, or whatever it is, and they're bugling, and they're close like that, it definitely gets your attention. Yeah, those are the sights, sounds, and smells that don't leave you. That's yeah, awesome. Absolutely. It's what we're, you know, I know I personally live for. I mean, heck, it's oh, one for of the sure. that I moved out west, you know, and in the first place was to literally chase bugles every September. So you didn't know it, but when you were a kid, somebody taught you how to whistle, but in reality, it was an elk bugle, and since you lived in Florida, you had no clue. <laughs> yeah, I was whistling up a storm and never had an elk come in, and then I freaking moved to Montana, <laughs> and here they are. <laughs> I actually have to be careful, you know, because like I might be whistling down the street, and here comes an elk like out of the woods, right? <laughs> exactly. <Yeah>. That's awesome. <laughs> That's so, awesome. And then you guys have photographed for ever since that day, right? Together whenever you get a chance. Yeah, so what I'll say is, yeah, that, that friendship actually grew into a, a, a mentorship between us. We helped each other out a lot. We've, over the years, have always been, tried to be the guys that won't just be the yes men to each other. You know, try to be the guys that we can rely on to say, hey, I'm going to send you an image. Tell me what you think of it, honestly. Um, you know, our styles are very different. Um, I think Dale would 100% agree with that. Our, our editing style is different. Our, our composing style is different. But edit, Dale takes amazing photos. Um, if you guys, I'm sure you will get a chance to, you know, um, let you tell about your Instagram and everything too, Dale. But, you know, it's it, he's got a, a, just a unique style and a unique uh, editing style and, and a unique way of composing images. But we all still can give each other advice and give each other pointers and, you know, point out little things that we might um, see that they may not see or that I might not see that he can tell me about, right? And it's been really beneficial over the years. We've talked about it before about, you know, having a mentor, having somebody that you can kind of do that with. And um, even though we were both pretty green and, you know, I might have been photographing a little bit longer than him, but not much. And it still was really beneficial for us to be able to bounce those things off of each other. And, and, I, and we still do to this day. We do it less often now. But we still do it to this day. If I have, if I post something that is just screwy, Dale has no problem with pinging me and DMing me and saying, "Dude, <laughs> what is this crap, man?" You know, and it's like, oh, he's like, "You getting lazy or what?" You know, and calling me out. And it's that's what it's about, right? I mean, it's, you know, you need that honesty sometimes. So it's been good that way too. Plus, like I said, I was fortunate enough to be one of his groomsmen and be able to go to his wedding, and our families are, you know, become friends and. 
um, you know, I think it's a lifelong friendship that'll just last because of the experiences that we've had. So that's awesome. awesome. Good stuff. With that being said, and you guys calling each other out and the fact that Dale's been the full-time professional this last year, we're going to go ahead and I think call each other out and do a few pro tips this week. And we're going to take advantage of some of the skills that Dale's picked up along the way and then kind of discuss what each of us has picked up recently. I'll go ahead and start. But you only have one, you said, so that's not going to last very long. No, but then I can just (laughs) sit back and comment on everybody else's. And I don't have to worry about you uh, making comments in retaliation for what I said. (laughs) So... uh, I, I've just returned from, and I, I got the the 399 fever. I've just returned from Western Wyoming photographing bears. I wanted to see the four four cubs of the year um, that this uh, famous 399 bear in Grand Teton National Park um, had. And I went out there, and it's not the type of photography that I enjoy by any means. There were people everywhere. So mine is how to kind of separate yourself from the other thousand photographers that are in the same area. And how can you, how can you do that? And these are, you know, this is going to be something that we've talked about often. And uh, Adam Rice, Adam and Kate Rice were out and Adam had a, a client that he's, he's guiding trips. Now this client got some incredible images And it's because of what I'm about to talk about. And that's kind of learning to be predictive, not not photographing an animal in a park type situation that's, you know, somewhat habituated, not photographing them from the same location as everybody else. Learn to kind of watch, observe, predict behavior, predict movement and put yourself in a position where you're going to get an image that four or five hundred other people don't have the same exact image of four or five hundred. It was unbelievable. (laughs) I will put some pictures in the show notes. I've got one about three, half to three quarter of a mile long bear jam. And it's the most beautiful bear jam you've ever seen in your life. It's right, you know, at the base of the Teton mountains. And, uh, but it it was crazy. And, and, uh, I, I will give it to the, the staff from, Grand Teton National Park, because I've had some bad experiences in Yellowstone, but the Grand Teton staff and the volunteers that were working those bear jams did an incredible job. And while I might not have liked their decisions, they did a great job of of managing the crowd and giving the giving the bear an opportunity to go where she wanted to go. And uh, so hats off to them because I would not want to do their job ever. Well, and they're managing for wildlife. They're not man. Well, they're managing people for the benefit of the wildlife, right? So it's not always going to be the decision you want, but it's the best decision for the animal. For the animal, yep. Yeah. In fact, at one point, they just called off, said nobody's taking any more images of her tonight. She's we're letting her be because you could tell that she was fairly stressed, and the cubs were starting to react you know, in kind of a stressful manner. So everybody just backed off and let her, let her take them to bed. And that's what needed to happen definitely in that situation. But what I mean by learning to be predictive or, you know, don't photograph necessarily the animal where they are. If you've got an elk that's parallel in the road, everybody's going to stop at that elk, right? Get yourself up the road or if you see kind of a, a funnel in the topography, you know that that elk is probably going to follow that funnel in the topography. Get at the end of the funnel, and they're going to walk right into your lens. You're going to get a much better image that way. And this is, of course, photographing from the road, which is not something that everybody does. It's not, but when you get these park type situations, and you know you're in Yellowstone or you're in Grand Teton or Glacier or any of the Canadian parks learn to predict where the animals go and watch the behavior, figure out where they're going to be and what's going to give you the best image in the best light and best behavior. And I think that that is pro tip number one and something that everybody should try to focus on because far too many people are shooting behind the animal and you're getting some cute bear butts 
because she's got four cubs, but you're just getting bare butts. Well, and you're also creating a traffic jam, right? If you stop right yeah, there, exactly. it just creates the problem for everybody. So yep. if yep. you can predict it, that's the best way to go. And I think Dell would say the same thing for video. You can't do that. You have to be 100% predictive because you, it takes time to get set up, especially if you're setting up with a tripod and you're doing all the stuff that you need to do to get good video. You know, it's not run and gun with, you know, tripodless camera kind of things. You just, you got to have time to set up. So I'm always in that predictive mode and I would assume you are too, Dale. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I, and I think a lot of that has to do with going back to my photography, my wildlife photography type of stuff, because I mean, you know, Jason was talking about how we have two different styles and it's funny how, when we've been out photographing, literally we'll be looking at the same animal and go opposite directions trying to achieve a completely different image, you know, in the same scenario, if you will. So I, I think that's a, that's an absolutely great tip to say, Ron, is like always try to think, okay, if everybody else is doing this, how can I be different from that? Because, mm-hmm. you know, Mike, you're talking about 400 people, like 399 has been all over the place, right? This, it's like this year with the four cubs and everything. So it's like, how can, how can you make a different image than everybody else that's out there right now? And like you said, when you're doing that, you're going to miss shots. You just got to learn to be okay with it because if it happens the way that you anticipating that it's going to happen, you know, like I set up on a, on a big flower field and it's, it was open. She'd been in the open sagebrush, but she was kind of feeding in one direction. And I missed a ton of shots because she was way closer to the masses. And then she turned and came back through those flowers. So you've got, you know, low, low grass, it's open. You can see the cubs. You can see all four of them. Plus, you've got the spring flowers, so it kind of tells that little piece of the story. And not everybody else has it. So, But I, I missed a ton of shots. She stood up once. The cub, uh, two cubs were in the deep sagebrush, couldn't see her, so they were nervous. So they stood up, and one of them uh, let out a call. And she stood up immediately so they could see where she was at. And she was looking to see what they were nervous about, you know, of course. And there was the, the masses were set up where they kind of were parallel to that. Got her and, you know, the cubs standing in the same focal plane. Great. I didn't. I got the back of her head and I've got the, you know, the cubs standing up in the sagebrush ahead of her. But, you know, I missed that one, but I got the one I wanted. You know, Jason and Mike, I know you guys do the same thing when you're in those park type situations. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. And, and maybe I'll just tag onto that. I don't know if this counts as one of mine, but it's, uh, I see it a million times where people will just get caught up in the moment and they're just snapping away at the, at the critter. Like you said, like wherever the critter's at right there. And so many people do that. And very few people try to do exactly what you're saying, like be predictive. But the other thing I see people not doing is not taking the time to get the light right. I, and it's crazy to me how often I see it. It's so, it happens so much and it's, you know, I, and I get it. You get caught up in the moment. You just want to get some images, but I've, I've tried to learn to stop taking those types of images. Right. And just take my time to get where I want to be, to create the images I want to create, like Dale said. Um, and we've talked about that before having those images in your mind when you go into the field and that helps you a ton too. So, you know, get the light right and take the time to be predictive and your photography will go up tremendously just just by doing those two things so and i've watched you do that i mean i've actually watched you just neglect taking a a good pose or a good shot but it's in horrible light and you'll just turn around and you'll walk to wherever the light's going to be the right and then you just hope that you get that pose or whatever in that situation Yep. Yeah. And sometimes it doesn't work out right. I mean, sometimes you guess wrong and <laughs> you miss it, but it's well, it's so much worth it when it does come together. It's well worth it to take the chance and, and, you know, take that risk, so to speak, to, to have it come together. So, so that's a great tip, Ron. All right. Who's up? I think Jason, you better go. Okay. Yeah, I'll do that. So, One I've actually had on my little list of tips here that I've been wanting to share for a while is, um, you know, as more of us are shooting video and we've actually talked about getting tripods and that that have video heads and so on. But something to think about is I think a lot of us might be thinking about 
actually having like a gimbal setup and a tripod setup, or I'm sorry, a video head setup. And what I kind of finally did, if I'm if I'm in the field and I know I'm going to be shooting video at all, I've actually gone away from using my gimbal, and I've I've, I've purchased a, and actually I'll just tell you the brand too. I purchased a Miller CX2 Solo two stage carbon fiber tripod setup, and it has the it has a video head all. It's a it's a combo unit. And I've started using that to shoot with, um, even when I'm shooting my stills. And the reason I do that, right, is because your video quality is going to be so much better if you have that kind of a video head set up. And when you want a video, you're able to just switch to do video instead of having to try to, oh, I can't do video today because I've just got my gimbal, or I can't do any panning video because I just got my gimbal, or whatever the case might be. So that's one that I've been thinking of quite a bit and wanted to share with everybody is, it might be worth your time if you want to do more video to go ahead and invest in the setup like that, invest in a video head. Um, there's a lot of options out there. It, that price point on that one, I think, was around $1,700 when I bought it. So they're not cheap. But believe it or not, that's actually one of the cheaper ones out there for a good quality video head. And I think Mike would probably say, yeah, it's not really a good quality video head. But because, <laughs> <laughs> I mean, it's like, there's levels, right? And it's like you could you can spend super cheap and spend a couple hundred bucks on a video head setup that's just garbage, or then there's nothing in between until you get to that like that seventeen hundred to two thousand dollar range, and there's two or three options there that are you know they're okay, and then it goes from there up to like five or six thousand, and then it just goes on from there. So there's there's really not a lot of options. So I couldn't afford the the five or six thousand dollar option. And I just decided to go with this option to get me started and see how much I'd actually like it. So just something to think about for you guys as you're out there shooting. You may want to think about, you know, switching away from a gimbal for certain situations and have yourself a video headset up that you can actually take stills from and then be able to switch to video quickly. I think that's a good one. And I think that, you know, when you choose that tripod, you just, or that video head, you just got to, it's all based on weight. You just need to make sure you've got that accounted for and if you've got that done it's generally going to be pretty good but if you're shooting a 600 you want a pretty heavy video head for it yeah yeah that's the one downside is that that setup is a lot heavier than my gimbal so i do feel mike's pain a little bit when he's hauling around that bigger gear even though it's not close to what his setup weighs but it does add you know probably it probably adds seven or eight pounds to my setup by having that video head but it's well worth it yeah i just it is I just did the same thing. I got a different brand, a Cartoni, but just got a dedicated video head. And the only reason I pack the other one is for the 600 if, which I'm going to sell. It's still for sale <laughs> if anybody out there has a need for it. Well, you better tell them what kind of 600 it is. It's a 600 yeah, F4 yeah, exactly. vibration reduction um, Nikon. 600 f4 night core i guess which version uh the second second version so there's another version after it i think it's the first version that had vibration reduction but it's super sharp super sharp yeah and what's the difference between that and the version three weight weight yeah so they and they did the same thing that canon and sony have done um weight reduction and then the redistribution of glass inside or the glass elements inside which brings the majority of the weight because a lot of the weight in those lenses is from the glass so when they you know regrind or whatever those physicists do to bring the glass closer to the actual sensor you bring in the center of gravity closer to you so even if it's not as m that much lighter it feels like it's a lot lighter because it's closer to where your strength is you know, if you're trying to handhold the the lens instead of having all the glass clear out at the end, which is, you know, it's easier uh, for them. But when they reconfigured these lenses, they brought it closer to the center, closer to the, the actual camera body. So it, it feels a lot lighter to shoot, even if it's not as much lighter. All right. Well, I'll go with the next one and then we can save Dale for the last. Well, we'll do a couple if, if everybody's got them, but we'll leave Dale for the last. So it was a typical... Michael Morrow operation today and I don't have any tips lined up so I, I just went and started opening up all my cases and I'm like what can I talk about <laughs> but what I just ran into is did we have we talked about this before it's a first aid kit 
So I used to shoot for no, this company so. called Adventure Medical Kits. And they have a ton of varieties of kits. But what's cool about them is they're all sized for the activity that you're going to do. And this one's fairly small. I think we'll put a link in the show notes for people that aren't watching. But it, they call this the Mountain Series. And they've got like an Expedition Series. And they got a Hiker Series. But this has got just about everything I need that I'm probably going to run into when I'm out photographing. I mean, I'm not going to be out on some major expedition or I'm not going to be out on some extended stay, four or five night thing. But if I'm just out for the day, it's it's something that just gives you a little peace of mind. It's kind of, it's got some weight to it. But if you guys are out in the woods and a bull elk is going to about ram his antler through you, <laughs> then you might want to have one of these with you just for because i've actually been mountain biking a lot and the pedals have been tearing up my legs and i've been using it a lot just for you know band-aids and stuff like that so it comes in handy for all kinds of uses but if you're going to be hiking away from the road if you're going to be spending any time out and about you know or away from your car for half the day or whatever it's a pretty and what is it it's about the size of my fist maybe two fists as far as size goes, this was, I met the guy who invented these and he was a doctor. He was an emergency room doctor. So he really knew what he was doing when he put the stuff together. And it's got like, it lists what each little pocket has for wound, wound care and burn and blisters. And then there's another one over here that'll tell you cuts and scrapes and medications. So it's a pretty awesome little kit. I mean, even if you're just going to leave it in your car, it's probably, probably worth it. So it's not necessarily photography related, but this is something that you should have all the time yeah and actually uh we use that same exact one like every single guy has the sportsman's 100 in their pack at any time that we're doing stuff and then we'll carry like either a sportsman 300 or 400 as like a truck you know those 300s i think they carry like or, or, or they can cover like up to six people for seven days Yep. type of thing so yep. if we're gone for a week it, it's it's a little bit better but those yeah those adventure medical kits are really really nice and i mean I, th I think that's a really smart thing that people often overlook because you know even if you're doing you know going back to like park photography or something like that right like how hard is it just to throw it in your car when you're leaving to shoot some photos or something you never know what could happen if i mean even just tripping you know while, while you're hiking around or something like that and you bust up your knee right yep mm -hmm. yep so i highly recommend it. i i started carrying one in a little this one and then one that's a little bit smaller in all my packs it's a little bit more weight but it, i think it's worth it awesome all right dale pressure's on oh man <laughs> i don't know about that so mine is kind of a simple one but i think it's often overlooked and it's uh when able keep your background or your foreground simple so this can be in photography or videography and it doesn't matter if it's wildlife portrait product lifestyle photography but keeping a simple background or even a simple foreground uh just really helps to let your viewer understand what they're looking at and um like i said i think that's often overlooked even when ron was talking about like you know, the bears being in the sagebrush and he was waiting for him to get in that lower grass, you know, like that right there to me is something that, that he was looking at, you know, prior to even taking an image. So that was something that came to mind. And I think that it's very often overlooked. Well, and there's so many ways to do it, right? You can do it with a lens choice or you can do it with putting yourself in the right position. But the number one thing is to just definitely make sure you're paying attention to it and then once you've figured out that hey i want to do this choose the right lens or choose the right setting to get that to accomplish that because i agree with you 100 percent. yeah it's a really good one a matter of fact it was it was early on in my little photography beginnings and i remember i was in yellowstone <laughs> and i photographed a bull elk and i really wasn't paying attention to the background much and <laughs> it's actually on my feet i think but it's a it's a it's a nice seven point bull and he's bugling and his head's back, but because of the background, it looks like he's got about a thirty foot log coming out of his mouth as he's bugling. So it's a it's not it's not a great image because of that, but I mean it was great it would have been great otherwise if I'd have been paying attention. But yeah, so that's a really good really good tip. <laughs> yeah. I had 
several while I was, I just got back. So I'm going through doing my edits and several images. I had a, a moose in velvet. And we'd been looking for one all weekend. We only saw one um, younger bull. And I was trying to clean up the background, but you couldn't because he was, he was on the other side of this kind of open park and he was staying real close to the timber. So there were probably six or seven shots that would have been fantastic if he didn't have a log going through both ears. He looked like he had, you guys remember one of those uh, things you used to put on your head that had the arrow coming out both sides, just <laughs> yeah. looped around your head. That's exactly <laughs> what this bowl looked like. So it, most of them are unusable. A couple times he got against a, I couldn't move, um, unfortunately, to make it a better shot. But a couple times he did have a nice clean, you know, at least pine tree or a conifer in the background that at least gave you one color when you were able to separate them a little bit. But yeah, so I just waited for him to do some unique things. He scratched under one leg and, and then he kept doing, he was doing owl impressions. I actually went to this spot to look for a great gray owl. And so this bull did me one better. I got the bull and he did owl impressions because he kept turning his head clear back over his body in both directions. So mission sort of accomplished. <laughs> I thought you were going to say he was hooting or something. but <laughs> no, Or bobbing. That's what I was looking for. Well, yeah, he was bobbing and shaking. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Just turning the head around. I can't even do it. Well, yeah, that's that's a good one. I like clean backgrounds is probably the kind of goes with trying to separate and separate your subject from the background. But having a clean background is probably the comment that when people ask me to talk about their images, that's got to be number one. You know, try to get yourself in a position that's going to give you a better, cleaner look at the animal and separate them from everything else. Go in reverse order. Dale. You're up again. <laughs> I did another you, one. You got another one. Back to back to back. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's see. Uh, if you're not ready, we'll go that? to Dale. Take a minute here. I got one that I can throw in real quick. So more and more people are shooting video, right? So that means, and I know Ron has had this. I don't know about you, Jason and Dale. I know you deal with this all the time. But when you start shooting video, you start getting all kinds of little accessories, and you got to have this little thing to hold this monitor and you got to have this little rail to hold your focus or whatever i mean there's a million little parts and pieces and i'm always like fumbling around for like a coin or something to tighten a screw or you know you got something that's loose and oh it's this size of an allen wrench well i don't carry a package of allen wrenches to figure it out or star wrenches or any of that kind of stuff you don't carry like one of these right here. <clears throat> exactly. I was gonna say that's <laughs> that that the one you have that you're showing there. That's from a bicycle shop, you know. And but there's this new one that I found on uh, Amazon. It's by Small Rig. If you guys are looking at photo stuff on Amazon, you'll see Small Rig makes all kinds of little things. But they make this little tool that is really small. I don't know. It's about the size of a. I don't know what would you get. It's probably two and a half inches long. But it's got Phillips, it's got star heads, it's got a flat head, it's got four different sizes of Allen wrenches in it. And this little thing has saved my bacon so many times. And it's so light and it's it just packs up. I mean, it comes with this fancy little case. But I usually just take it out and just throw it in my pocket or throw it in the pack. Red actually makes one too that's way more robust. So it's a little bit bigger as far as more tools inside of it. But, and these are only like 25 bucks from Red. It's probably the cheapest thing that Red sells on their website. But I um, <laughs> highly recommend picking one of these up because there's always something that's loose or there's always something that you just need to adjust. And if you don't have that right tool, you know, it's just, it's going to either bug you or you're not going to be able to shoot. So I just thought it'd be a good little thing to talk about. And it's so convenient. And what Dale was just showing is, I'm, I believe that's probably one from a bike, a bike shop. I think it's actually an Easton one of all oh, Okay, things. so that might be for but, a bow or something, but... Yeah, um, like something for archery, but I use it all the time for everything. Yeah, they're they're so handy to have. So, And you can go to your local bike shop, you know, just a... Not like a sporting goods store, but more like a, a professional bike shop where you're going to find, you know, everything for mountain biking or whatever. And they're going to have some sort of tool that has a lot of what you need. It's not going to be perfect, 
the one from small rig is for camera stuff so it's going to have the actual sizes of allen uh, wrenches that you actually need and some of the star wrenches that are very popular on camera equipment that's good awesome. well, i'm making a note <laughs> I'll, we'll put a link in the show notes to that small rig one because it's, like I said, it was only 20 bucks and I really like it. Jason. Okay, this one's really simple. We get asked quite a bit on uh, how in, in, you know, DMs and questions from listeners about how we can uh, help make uh, travel a little bit easier when we do our little travels, uh, our travel trips, and we're camping out of our vehicles and things like that. And one of my favorite things that i have with me and it's so super simple and i don't have it with me but everybody knows what a travel pillow looks like but you know as i talked before when i go out and i do my crazy drive all night and then shoot all day and try to take a nap in the middle of the day those travel pillows make that nap in that car so much more uh comfortable and i rely on that thing tremendously i don't i have one in all my vehicles and it's specifically for the sole purpose of taking a nap in the middle of the day when I'm out doing my photography stuff. So, so a really simple one, easy. They're super cheap. You can get them for 10 or 15 bucks at any airport or any Walmart or wherever you're at. And it's easy to throw behind the seat of your vehicle or, you know, in a, in a tote or whatever. And it saved my bacon and saved my neck um, multiple times when I've been out doing my photography stuff. So I always yeah. pack a little pillow with me for that kind of stuff it's just so handy to have okay so you know what you know what else travel pillows are good for so <laughs> my my next one is uh hemorrhoids especially if you're going if you're going to one of these park situations no <laughs> but the, but thanks for bringing that up now sure. i'm not going to be able to stop thinking about it <laughs> so when you're in these park situations one piece of equipment that you definitely want to take with you is a bean bag because when you're when you're going especially specifically to photograph bears a lot of times you can't get out of your vehicle i mean if the bears out there 150 yards you're you're safe to get out of the vehicle uh, but once they start closing the distance if you don't feel that you need to be in the vehicle the park service is going to tell you you have to be so take a bean bag it makes a great rest just drop it on your window and you can shoot out the window. It'll give you a dead rest, actually. And a couple of cheap options. You can, you know, go down and just buy the empty bag and then just throw popcorn in it or buy a bag of, you know, beans, kidney beans, and throw that inside the, the bean bag. That'll give you the perfect texture. And what I was going to say with the travel pillow is there are times where you're not quite as high as you would like to be just throw your travel pillow over the top of your door then put the bean bag on top of the travel pillow and it'll give you an extra couple inches of height to make it a lot more comfortable to shoot and <laughs> i'm not saying that i've ever done that but i'm not saying i haven't <laughs> <laughs> all right ron what's your next one that was my next one. Oh, you did that one do i have to do i have to do the dale and go back to back no that was good i, I thought you were just piggybacking on on jason well like i kind of was it was just timely yeah that was perfect. so yeah well we used to I do mean, that all the time in alaska because you didn't want to travel with you didn't want to fill up your bag with rice or whatever popcorn you know you, just, you didn't want to take that weight so it's super easy to have an empty bean bag and when you get there you just whip into a shop and pick up rice or whatever but there's a lot better things out now where you can actually get those really uh, yep. plastic beads or you can find Suit some the stuff plastic that, beads that form fit yep. yeah and they are pretty light so you can travel with them if you have to all right dale all right um, up. so one of the things my, michael was talking about doing uh more video stuff and one of the things that i've had to learn so i guess this is kind of coming from pro photographer to now pro videographer, if you will, is make sure to try to get your audio when you're doing, or when you're doing video to get your audio right in camera, not just looking at it, if you will. Um, and, and I know that's kind of a weird way to say it, but um, one of the, one of the hardest things for me when, when I was transitioning 
was making sure the audio levels were high enough in the camera so I wasn't trying to boost it once that I was in post. And now you're degrading the audio because you're having to boost the crap out of it to get it to the levels you actually need it to be. So I think that's something to like really pay attention to, you know, and obviously not all the time you're going to be able to get great audio, but when you do, you know, it's, it, it, it's hard to come back from it when you know that you could have had some really, really awesome audio. I think the best way to do that is to play with your camera beforehand and know what you're doing. And then headphones are essential for that kind of thing, because if you're dealing with all kinds of extra noise and you look at that little meter and you think it's good enough, it right. probably isn't. But and then the flip side is, is if you run it up too high, then you ruin it too, right, Dale? So you can't you know, there's right. that sweet spot that you gotta hit that makes it work right. And I feel like I'm still learning now that I'm a year into this gig that uh I still have times that you know, I I seem to always have the audio too low. And it's and it's because I have headphones on that I think that it's good. You know what I mean? Because I can hear so well, like having a sense. I don't have noise canceling headphones by any means, but if I'm out in the woods and it's super quiet around me, then of course everything that's coming through my headphones makes it sound so much louder than it actually is. So then I actually kind of go reverse and I don't even look at the meter. I'm just trying to listen to what's going on and I notice that I have it too low. So then I'm trying to boost audio and it ends up, you know, kind of screwing me up there. So you saying that with having that fine line and then also paying attention to your meter as well as having the headphones in is super crucial. Yeah, one of, one of the other pitfalls that you can run into is if you have your volume on your headphones way up, it's just exactly what you said. You think it's great. But in reality, it's just that amplifier in your camera that's boosting your headphones. In. So that meter comes in so handy because it's going to tell you exactly where it's at. And then there's a sweet spot, and every camera I've ever used is different. So you really need to play around with it a little bit and figure out on that particular camera, hey, this is, if I have it running at minus 6 dB or, you know, right at minus 3 dB or some cameras are right at zero, that's where you want it. And it'll go from green to yellow to red. And if you can get it, if you're watching a meter and you can have it, kind of touching yellow but not all the time but be all the way up in the green generally you're going to be pretty good you never want red red is bad so if you're going to play with the meters that's what you want to do and you're generally going to have everything set up just right yeah the other thing about audio is well and this goes back to using it at home before you take it in the field i had a oh crap i can't even remember the a road mic that I always used on my on my camera for audio. And I wanted to step it up a little bit, get a little bit better audio, so I bought this Audio Technica, you know, $700 microphone, stereo microphone. And I thought, well this thing, if the road mic, you know, if I have to do this, throw a battery in it, whatever. I shouldn't shouldn't need to do anything with a more expensive mic, and I put on there's nowhere to put a battery in, so I assumed when you plug it in, you're golden. And then we were up, you know, what, last year um, at the Northwest Glacier. And I wanted to get audio of the glacier calving. And I'm looking at my meter and there's nothing going on at all. Even when the boat is like rocking and you can hear the, you know, no other noise is being made, but you can hear the boat hitting the water while it's rocking on the aluminum hull. And... I'm like, Michael, this thing is not working. And the glacier's calved at this point like four or five times. And he's like, Hey dummy, you gotta turn on the you gotta turn on the phantom power. Speaking of a friend that'll just tell it like it is. <laughs> <laughs> Michael's that guy for me. <laughs> so yeah, I didn't you can't put batteries in it because it runs off of the actual recorder batteries. And so I didn't have the phantom power on and so my mic wasn't working. It was a $700 weight that I was holding up in the air at that point in time. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you can. Uh, that's why there's guys that just do audio. It's It can get really, I mean, just like we take photos, there's guys that, or gals and guys that just specialize in audio. So it's an awful big undertaking if you're going to try to do it all. But 
that's kind of that's Dale. I mean, that's what that's what you do. You're hired to do it all, right? Because you can't have 17 people out in the woods, so you got to kind of figure it out. Yeah, and I mean, most of the time we're running one camera guy, unless you know it's a necessity to have two, if you will. And I mean, you start throwing two or three guests in there so now you're having to get audio for three different people and yeah you know you can't lob up everybody and you know it, it makes it it makes it pretty wild right because now you're doing you're doing the audio part you're doing the video part and you're doing the photography part right and you only have so many cameras and it's like and you only have so many hands so you can only run you know one camera essentially at a time maybe two if you got a gopro going on or something like that but yeah it's it can get pretty wild. At but times. if you want a job and you want to make it in in some sort of industry, I mean, if you can do it all, you're you will be highly sought after. The other thing, and this is something that just came up, I was visiting with Adam Rice up in the up in the park, and having a directional setup, because like Jason and I were were filming a bear, I uh, wasn't it wasn't a park bear, and there's road noise because it was it was near a highway so got some great audio of this bear kind of grunting he was a, a big you know a mature boar that was going after a female and he was kind of grunting at her calling at her but you have this road noise and the other thing that you have is you know right at the edge of the road didn't want to leave the roadway because the bears were pretty close um you have gravel noise people walking or, you know, when I would just rotate, there would be that gravel noise. And I've been researching some solutions to that. And, you know, Adam was talking about they're, they're looking at getting a, a directional microphone set up. Uh, and also, like, a smaller version of one of those satellite dish looking things that you see on the NFL sidelines. And that pushes the or only accepts the sound from the front of the mic or from the in front of the mic so you could have separated that that bore in those calls from you know all the noise that was going on behind and that's something that i didn't think about either audio i'm finding as i start messing with it a little bit more is probably the most difficult part of putting a video together because it's just hard to you know pay attention to the noise that you're making as well as what you're trying to film. And I'm sure, Dale, you're dealing with that all the time as well, trying to minimize your noise so that you don't affect the end product. Well, and, and I mean, and also, you know, like you have the ambient sound, right? And, the, and you're trying to now mesh things and edit and try to make sense of it all, right? And it's like, it's it's just crazy. The learning curve that I've had to make over the past year and you know, going to the audio side. I mean, that, that to me has been probably one of the largest, you know, like you can get exposure pretty well, or, you know, you can get getting the action when it happens, but you start having to put everything together and then now make a, you know, whatever, a 25, 30 minute story out of it. It's like, it, it's pretty crazy. It's, it's been quite the learning experience. Well, and the quickest way to get people to turn your stuff off is to have bad audio. You could have the prettiest, prettiest video in the world, and if it doesn't jive with the audio, I guarantee you they're going to shut it off. So there's a, a guy that I watch on YouTube. Uh, he's a video dude. Uh, his, his channel is called Potato Jet. I don't know where Potato he got Jet. that. Potato Jet. Yeah, he's but freaking awesome. He did a whole thing on audio on microphones. Yep. And I'll yep. put a link, or actually, I'll just insert the video into our show notes because he brought some in. He brought in some audio professional that really knew these mics and they talked about the variety of mics and what you would use this for and what you'd use this for. So even if you're not interested in going out, it's interesting to learn that there's a million different setups out there that you could set up for different things. And it's just knowing that is, is helpful. All right. Well, Dale, first of all, thank you again. And if you wouldn't mind, throw out your Instagram and your your Facebook page and your website so people can find your work and take a look at those. Yeah, so um, on Facebook, you can just look up Restless Soul Photography. 
And then on Instagram it is restless underscore soul underscore photography. And I actually got rid of my website. I was kind of over that whole thing, but that's another story. Who uses <laughs> websites anymore? I mean, they're just, they're just so two thousands. <laughs> yeah. Uh, that's kind of, that's kind of where I was at. And Jason and I have talked about that a lot. So yeah, it's, it's crazy. I am not good at fulfillment. So my website is my one-stop shop for people that want to order prints. So that's, that's the only reason I keep that thing going. Well, Hey, thanks again, Dale. And thank you all for joining us this week. Look forward to next time. In the meantime, get out, do some shooting, put these things into practice, and let us know if there's a topic that you'd like to hear more about. You've been listening to the Wild and Exposed podcast. If you haven't yet, please give us a rating and a review. And make sure you're subscribed so that you'll get every episode we produce as soon as we drop it. And as always, thanks for tuning in. We're gonna make it someday. Nothing's gonna get in our way. We will be the biggest band in town.